This video is an affiliation with Collingwood Insurance. There's a great deal by the link right now, but more on that one later. So you want to buy your first car and you don't know much about cars. Well, luckily, I'm not only a driving instructor, but I'm also a car dealer as well. And in this video, I'm going to talk about budget, age, mileage, service history, cam belts, tax insurance, MOT, where to buy, transfer of ownership, and basic health checks you can make to help you make a wise decision when buying your first car. It just started raining, so I thought I'd come indoors for better audio quality, so you don't have to listen to all that rain. Right, you need to decide whether you want to pay monthly or whether you want to pay upfront. Personally, I think it's a better idea to pay monthly, simply because it will allow you to buy a more valuable car, which is going to be younger and more reliable. If you pay up front, you don't have to worry about the monthly payments, but you're probably going to get more breakdowns. But if you pay monthly, you're going to be able to afford a more expensive car. But the bonus is when you finish paying it off, that car is still going to be worth some money. Let's say you could either afford a thousand pound car up front or you could afford a £3,000 car if you can afford £100 a month for three years. After those three years and you finish paying off your loan, the car's still going to be worth £1,500. So in effect, even though you've got to pay interest and you will still have to pay for repairs, in effect, you're actually saving up a little bit. By the end of the term, you have something, an asset, that's worth money because there is actually a car ladder as well as a property ladder. And if you play it right, you can gradually build your way up. I certainly did. And although you'd have to pay interest on a loan for a newer car if you're to pay monthly, those interest payments are probably going to be less than the extra repairs of buying an older, cheaper car. Now, unless you're buying a brand new car with a manufacturer's warranty, you're really going to need to budget for breakdowns. I recommend £50 a month. That should cover you with a little bit of luck. But £100 a month will almost certainly cover you unless you're incredibly unlucky. Now, I know that sounds like a lot of money, especially, especially if you're young, but the bonus is you probably won't use all of that and you'll have a nice little nest egg to put towards whatever you fancy, maybe your next car or even a holiday. And the next thing I want to talk about is mileage. People in the UK are obsessed with mileage. It really makes a big difference to the value of the car, but you can use that to your advantage, especially if you trust me a little bit, age is more important than mileage. Let's say you've got a 20 year old car with 50,000 miles, or you've got a five year old car with 100,000 miles. I was gonna say I'll put money on it, but I don't want anyone to hold me to this, but I am fairly certain that five year old car with double the mileage is gonna be far more reliable than that very old 20 year old car with only 50,000 miles. Age matters more than miles. If you have a young car with a lot of miles, that car has been driven on the motorway a lot. Now, if you don't know, motorway mileage is incredibly light on a car. It doesn't wear a car much. Also, if someone does a lot of miles in their car, they're much more likely to look after it. They spend a lot of time in it. They rely on it probably to go to work. So if there's something wrong, they're gonna pay to put it right. And as it's a new car, that's probably worth a little bit more. They're also not as afraid of spending some money on it. But if you've got a very old car that hardly gets used, it's still gonna have had an awful long time to degrade. Winter, summer, winter, summer, 20 years old, you've got 20 of those. That's gonna degrade the rubbers. So let's say you've got a sunroof, that's probably gonna leak. And yes, I've had plenty experiences of being in an old car with a sunroof, with only 35,000 miles on it. Okay, this is one, one experience I can think of, going around a corner, oh, I get a wet back in my ear with this water. That's not the only time it's happened, that's just one time I can think of. And Things like your bushes, your suspension bushes, even if you're not using them, they're gonna wear. Your brakes are gonna become corroded and they're gonna need replacing, even though you haven't used them that much. Your tires, 
they're gonna need replacing even though you haven't used that much because they degrade with time. Time is very powerful and it will eventually turn a car back to dust. It will take a very long time to go back to dust, but time has a big effect on a car's wear. Whereas a high mileage car that's been used is a well-oiled machine, as long as it's been serviced. Now I'm gonna talk about servicing. But just before I talk about servicing, I just wanna mention, if someone has a car and doesn't spend much time in it and they do very low miles, they're far more likely to ignore niggly faults, problems. Problems you're gonna find a week, two weeks into owning that car. They're gonna put up with them because they don't really care. They don't spend enough time in the car. Whereas someone who spends a lot of time in a car and does a lot of miles over a short time is gonna more than likely put those right. And then there's the clutch as well. Clutches wear considerably faster around town than they do on the motorway. So just because the car is low miles, it doesn't mean it's gonna have a clutch that lasts longer. You just don't know with the clutch, it all depends on how it's been used. Now I'm gonna talk about servicing, and it's really important to buy a car with a full service history or close to full service history. The main reason is oil. The oil is gonna to need to be changed on a car. Any car needs its oil changed, any petrol or diesel car. If you don't change it, you're gonna get problems. The oil is not gonna protect your engine very well when it's too old. The oil can hurt your engine when the oil gets old because when the oil gets old, it can form sludge, which then can block passageways that the oil uses to lubricate your engine, which then can lead to oil starvation to certain parts of your engine, which leads to excessive wear which then can lead to early premature engine failure. So make sure the car has a full service history, or at least very close to a full service history. Another great thing about having a full service history is that you can look back through the history of the car to see what problems it's had. Because during the service, that's the time when the mechanic is gonna pick up faults with the car. They're gonna write those faults down and possibly even provide you with a quote to repair it. So you can look back through the invoices and receipts for the car, which my car has an awful lot of, as you can see, because that's 166,000 miles worth of town driving, the worst sort of driving you can have, so lots of things do go wrong. And you can look back through those receipts and see what's gone wrong. Say you find a service that recommends replacing something because there's an oil leak, say. Hopefully they've even given the price to replace that oil or, or to repair that oil leak, to replace whatever they needed to replace to repair the oil leak, then you can look for an invoice to see if that's actually been done. Then you know whether or not it's probably still got an oil leak. That's really helpful in you checking the health of the car. Also, if you want a quick way of finding out if it's been serviced, when it needs to be serviced, is find the owner's pouch, find the booklet in it, which this one says maintenance program, but it might say service booklet or something like that. This will tell you how often the car needs to be serviced. And also if you look through the pages, you can see each time it's been serviced because there'll be a date and a mileage and a stamp by the garage. But of course, this booklet could be forged. Someone could buy a stamp, stamp it and write it in themselves. But then forgery is often um, a risk with anything you do, I guess. That's why invoices are more reliable because it's much harder to forge an invoice. But generally speaking, these aren't forged. And if it was, you could probably tell because every single page would look exactly the same and probably done on the same day. Now I'm gonna talk about the ticking time bomb, the cam belt and the cam chain. When either of these fail, your engine is probably beyond economical repair. You're gonna need a new engine, basically. Cam chains should last a life of the vehicle, which is why people like them, because they think, oh, I don't have to worry about replacing cam belts, I've got a cam chain. I don't really like them though, because they're more likely to go wrong. As people don't change them, they get old and they do eventually fail. Cam belts need to be changed, again, as per the manufacturer's recommendations, which can be found in this book. This can actually be a very good bargaining tool for you. Because when you're buying a car, check to see when it had its last cam belt, if it has a cam belt. Call the mechanic up, call your mechanic and ask, does this car I'm buying have a cam belt or a cam chain? How often does it need replacing and how much is it to replace? And then compare that 
with what has happened to the car you're thinking about buying. Has it had a recent cam belt change? Has it ever had a cam belt change? Is it due one soon? Is it well overdue? If it's well overdue or due one soon, use the cost to replace it as a, as a bargaining tool to get money off the car you're buying. So in effect, when you buy that car, you are buying a car now with a new cam belt because you now have that money where you can go to the garage straight away and get it replaced to reduce your risk. I don't recommend not replacing it though if it's due because that does lead to the death of many innocent vehicles. Another great way you can check some of the history of the car, at least in the UK, is to Google MOT history check and type in the registration number of the vehicle you're thinking of buying. Then you'll be able to see the history of the MOTs it's had and what faults have come up in those MOTs. And then you can query if those faults have been rectified. And if you're wondering what an MOT is, an MOT is basically a health check for your car. It's not a service. Don't confuse it with a service because a service is for the longevity of your car to make sure that it runs well and is reliable. Whereas an MOT is a safety check to make sure that it's safe. Seat belts, brakes, tires, corrosion, so structural integrity of the car, windscreen wipers, that kind of thing. You have to have an MOT every year but you don't have to have an MOT until a car is three years old. The first MOT happens on its third birthday, and when a car reaches 40 at the moment, it's MOT exempt. An MOT normally costs about 50 pounds. It can be less, but it can't be much more. The government actually cap how much a garage can charge for the MOT. At the moment, I think it's around about 58 pounds. It might be a bit more than that now. It does go up a little bit every year. And although I said the cost of the MOT is capped, that's the cost of the test. The cost to put the things right that the test has found can be anything. In fact, that can be the reason why the car goes to the scrapyard because it's had an MOT test, the cost to put the things right exceeds the value of the car, and the owner goes, well, it's not worth spending that on the car. I may as well buy another car. Driving a car without an MOT is illegal, and if the police catch you, you will get into trouble. However, you can drive to the garage if you have an MOT test pre-booked. So if you call a garage, book an MOT test for your car, you can drive your car that doesn't have an MOT to your garage to get it tested. Now I'm gonna talk about car tax, or VED, vehicle excise duty. If you want to drive a car on the road legally, you have to tax it. If you want to own a car and not tax it, you can sawn it and keep it off the road. SORN, S-O-R-N, stands for Statutory Off-Road Notification. It's free to do, but then the car must stay off the road in a garage or a driveway or on private land somewhere. Tax can vary greatly from car to car, and it's really important for you to find out how much it costs to tax your car before you buy it, to make sure you don't end up spending a lot of money because it can be as little as zero, but it can be an awful lot more than that. A way of finding out, there's two main ways I find out. One is I Google calculate vehicle tax rates and then I fill out the form and that will tell me how much it is to tax. Although you need to know a lot about the car, you need to know when it's registered and you need to know the exact model of the car for it to tell you because every car is different. The same car can be more expensive or cheaper just based on when it was registered. Or even easier, if you're searching for your car via the Auto Trader website, if you click on running costs, it will tell you how much it is to tax in there. That's my preferred method because it's a lot easier, but it depends if your car is on Auto Trader or not. And that brings me on to where you should search for a car. I don't recommend going to a dealer and looking around what they have for sale because that really limits your selection. They're not gonna have nearly as many cars for sale, not even a fraction of what is on Auto Trader. You're much better off going on Auto Trader, get the app from Android or Apple, or go on the internet and search cars that way. You're gonna get most of the cars in the UK. You can also look on Facebook Marketplace, Gumtree, eBay Motors, and Piston Heads. Between all those, you're really gonna be finding most of the cars that are for sale in the UK. Obviously narrow it down to how far you're willing to travel. Now I'm going to talk about insurance and there's three flavors of insurance. Third party, third party fire and theft and fully comprehensive. 
third party basically means if you hit somebody, the insurer is gonna pay for them, but they're not gonna pay for you. Third party fire and theft means that they will pay for you again if you hit someone, but they will also pay if your car is stolen or if it catches fire. And then you've got fully comprehensive, which will insure you for fire, theft, you hit somebody, it will pay for them, but it will also pay for you. So it's only fully comprehensive where you actually get paid out for your own car if you're the person at fault. Now, if you want to save money insurance, there's a couple of things you can do. The most obvious one is to get a black box, which is a telematics box, which monitors your driving. There may also be a curfew in there as well, and that can bring the price down of your premium. However, if you drive poorly, your premium may go up, but if you drive better, it can come down. If you agree a curfew, you will only be able to drive during certain hours. So you have to decide what's right for you. Another way to save money is to add additional drivers to your policy. Not your friend, but maybe your mum and dad, or even your grandma and granddad. Add older people to your policy, that can bring it down. I find two to be the optimum number. Once you add three, the price starts going up again. It's important not to front your policy. To front your policy, that means you will put, say, your mum or your dad on your policy as the main driver and put you as an additional driver when actually you are the main driver. That is illegal and you may lose a claim if you do that and you could get into trouble as well if you're caught. Another problem with fronted policies is that you don't build up a no claims bonus to get a discount off your insurance. And that leads me on to no claims bonus. No claims bonus is a discount off your insurance if you go a year without claiming and you can accrue years. So if you've got five years no claims bonus, you can receive quite a big discount on your insurance. You can also normally protect your no claims bonus. So if you were to have an accident, if you were to make a claim, you wouldn't lose it. But don't think because you keep your no claims bonus, your policy won't go up. It most certainly will go up if you make a claim because that no claims bonus is a discount off of your premium. It's a percentage discount. Let's say five years gives you a 50% discount. If you make a claim, your policy is gonna go up. You may keep your 50% discount, but that 50% discount is now gonna be off of a higher premium. So therefore, you're still gonna pay more. How much of a discount you get based on how many years you have is different for every provider. That's why you wanna check out confuse.com to compare insurance to make sure you get yourself the best deal. You can also play around and experiment with the excess to make your premium lower. And excess is how much you would pay before you get paid by the insurer if you were to make a claim. So let's say you had a 500 pound excess and you had a 2,000 pound claim. What would happen is the insurer would only give you 1,500 pounds because they would minus that 500 pound off of what they pay out to you. Another great way to save money on insurance is a 0% credit card. If you're old enough to get a 0% credit card, and what I mean by 0% is quite often when you get a credit card, there's a deal for the first nine months, you get 0% on purchases. Don't confuse purchases with balance transfers, that's a different thing. If you do that, you can buy your insurance policy upfront in one payment. And that's great because if you pay monthly for your insurance, normally you get charged like 20% interest, quite a lot. Whereas if you've got a 0% credit card and you buy it on that credit card, you can then pay that credit card off monthly and not accrue any interest because it's 0% for that, for that period. That's actually what I did when I paid for my first insurance policy upfront. It was about 900 quid. I didn't have 900 quid back then and I got the credit card, paid for it that way paid it off monthly, saved myself that interest. When buying a car in the UK, you need to register it in your name so that you're responsible for the car. For example, speeding tickets. The police need to know who to send that to. And you do that with this V5 form. It's called a V5C, but I call it V5 for short. I've covered up sensitive information here to protect the next owner from fraud. And I don't recommend buying, one, buying a car without one of these because you are opening yourself up to fraud. It's very easy for the seller to get a new one of these if they've misplaced it. They just have to pay 25 pounds to the DVLA and send off a form. What's good about the front page of the V5C is down here it tells you how many former keepers the car has had. So this car has had one former keeper. Now that, that does not mean the car has only had one owner because that is one former keeper before the person who currently owns the car. 
So if you're gonna buy the car, it's now two former keepers. So when you get your new V5 document through, it's gonna say two and you're gonna be the third. It's important to note that the V5 does not prove who owns the car. To prove you own the car, you have to prove you've paid for the car. The V5 just says who is responsible for the car. When you buy a car and you want to register it in your name, you need to go to this page of the V5 and fill out section six. It's really easy to do. You just put your name, address in there, and then both the previous keeper and the new keeper, which will be you, will sign this. Then it's the responsibility of the previous keeper, the person selling the car, to send this off to the DVLA. They're the people who have to post it for you. What's good about this part of the V5 is it has quite a lot of information about the car, and you can also see when the previous owner, the person you're buying it from, acquired it. So the previous owner got this car in September 2018. Before you drive the car, you will need to tax it because tax is no longer owner transferable. And you can use this form to help with that, the V5C slash two, section 10 here. Use the document reference, go online, Google taxmycar.gov and find the .gov website to do that. And it's very quick and easy with this form. You used to be able to do it in the post office. You may still be able to do it in the post office, but I haven't done that in about 15 years, so I'm not sure. Also, make sure you take this form with you, this slip with you when you buy the car, because if you don't get your new logbook through, your logbook is your V5C, logbook's just an old term um, that was given to this form. If you don't get the new one through within, I believe it's like four weeks, you can then contact the DVLA, chase them up, and this form will make the process a lot quicker in chasing them up, and you will save yourself a 25 pound fee. Look under the bonnet for oil leaks. See if there's any mess anywhere. It should be nice and clean. A little bit of dirt is okay. You're gonna get dirt from driving down the road, but there shouldn't be noticeable amounts of oil and sludge building up. Then take the oil filler cap off and look underneath it. Whoops. Joys of trying to look at the camera at the same time as what you're doing. And that shouldn't be white. That should be black. If it's got thick white gunk over it, that's a very bad sign. A tiny bit of white is okay just from condensation, but if you've got a lot of white there, that means there's water getting in your oil. Also, pull the dipstick out and have a look at the dipstick. The dipstick also should be black or like a goldy brown color. It shouldn't be white. If that's white, you've got a problem. Also make sure you check your fluid levels. Can be quite awkward to check some of them. Like the coolant one is here and I've got a look down there to see how much coolant's in there. If you're struggling to see it, give the car a little wiggle. And if you wiggle the car with the suspension, the fluids move a little bit and that can help you see the fluid in there. Also, holding a torch on there can help you see the fluid too. And also check your brake fluid. Main fluids is oil, coolant and brake fluid. Can't often check your screen wash, but then again, that's not really an issue. You can check your suspension by bouncing each corner of the car up and down do it on all four corners and the car should settle really quickly. It shouldn't keep bouncing. Get the seller of the car to start the engine whilst you look at the exhaust. You shouldn't see any black oil come out of the exhaust. There might be a little bit of water and soot, so black water, that's fine, but not oil. There also shouldn't be excessive amounts of white smoke and no blue smoke. The amount of white smoke this car's giving off is fine for a cold start. Now, I apologize for all the banging. I live near the Colchester Barracks gun firing range. What you can do is you can look at the window, look at the windscreen. Is there any cracks? Particularly look at the lower bit where this black bit is because sometimes cracks can hide there and you won't notice, but they will fail the MOT. And they're not such a big deal, cracks, but you're still gonna have to pay excess on your insurance to get a new windscreen. So look for anything like that and use it to bargain on the price. Also check the windscreen wipers. Lift them up and check the rubbers. Are they split? Try the windscreen wipers out. Do they actually clear water? Try the washer jets too. Essentially, you wanna try every, everything on the car, all the electrics, anything that does something, you wanna make sure it does that thing. Check all four tires for wear. Obviously, the more worn the tires are, the sooner you're gonna to have to replace them. A brand new tire will have eight mil of tread, so these grooves will be eight mil deep, and a tire really has had it by around three mil. 
However, the legal limit is 1.6 mil. You can see these little bumps here in the tread. They're 1.6 mil high. So when the main tread of the tire gets to these bumps, then you know it needs replacing. Also look in the wheel for the brakes, these brake discs. I can make this brighter now for you so you can see. There we go, that's the brake disc. It goes around inside the wheel. And it's normal for them to be rusty if the car hasn't been driven for, well, even sometimes only half a day. But drive the car and that rust should go away. It should become clean and shiny metal fairly quickly. Only a five minute drive should be needed to clean those off. If the rust remains, then you know your brake discs are probably gonna need replacing due to corrosion. Then take a walk around the car, looking at the lower edge of the car and try and scan your eyes over the whole body, particularly the lower edges around the wheel arch where rust is likely to start and around the sill here at the bottom below the doors. Go all the way around the car, scan the whole of the bodywork and that way hopefully you'll find any problems, any scratches and imperfections. Also look for paint. If you can see a little bit of paint on this black trim here, for example, it may mean it's had a repair, which is not necessarily a problem, but you want to know about the repair. Was the repair extensive or was it small? When checking over the bodywork of the car, look at the panel gaps too. They should be even. If I go closer now to the bumper, where this panel gap is, this shut line, it's nice and even, top to bottom, and nice and close. Not all panel gaps are going to be that close, but they need to be even. The door has a bigger panel gap, that's normal for a door, but it's nice and even all the way around, as you can see, as it should be. A good place to check is the boot. If you look at the panel gap on the boot, that's normally a dead giveaway because if someone's hit this car hard from behind, what you often find is the gap on the right would be significantly bigger than the gap on the left or the other way around. Unless, of course, you own a car that's built by Lotus, in which case expect the panel gaps to be all over the place, such as this massive gap here at the front, which gets a bit more narrow near the bottom, but that's just Lotus build quality for you. And panel gaps do matter because, I mean, maybe not on this car, because all these cars are like that, but on a well-built car, like a Volkswagen or a Mazda, if your panel gaps are different in different places, it doesn't mean it's had a small accident. Most of the time it means it's had a big accident and maybe the chassis is slightly twisted. Also make sure you have a quick look under the car to check for any oil leaks. Oil leaks on the pavement or oil leaks under the car. This car did have an oil leak when I got it, but that's now fixed. It turned out just to be a leaky oil sump plug. The easy bit is to get in the car and check that everything works. Absolutely everything. Get it started and go through all of the buttons there's the radio. You can try that out as well. See if the sat nav works. Absolutely everything. Anything that does anything, check to see that it does that thing. As I said earlier, like glove box opens and it closes and it stays closed. Obviously, don't forget to check the reverse sensors. So that's them engaging. Let's back up, see if it makes a noise. There we go. They work. Also check the handbrake, make sure it doesn't go too high before it's firm. So this one stops about there, which is a little bit higher than I'm used to, but I know with these cars, they are a little bit higher anyway. If this one had a problem, it would be pointing up towards the sky. Try to make sure you go for a drive where you're gonna be checking all the gears. Make sure all the gears go into place and make sure you reverse the car as well. Also pay attention to the clutch. Is it really high before it moves? This one's about halfway up, which is good. Also, is it really firm? If a clutch is really high or really hard to press, it's normally a sign that the clutch is worn. However, some cars, particularly French cars, I do find they generally have quite a high clutch bite point anyway. During the test drive, you're listening. You're listening to weird noises you're not used to from a car, particularly knocks and bumps when you go over a bump. Quite often when you go over a bump, it's a bit of a fud. But if you get some different sound, some more metallic sound, then you may have a problem with your suspension. So it's good to test your car on a variety of roads, not necessarily just the smoothest roads in the area. Don't be afraid to go take it for a test drive down a country lane. 
the car should not pull from left to right. When you're driving down the road, it should feel like it's going in a straight line, like this one is. And also when you brake, there's no one behind, so I'll brake now. The car doesn't pull either side, it goes in a straight line. It's very important to check that too. If your car's pulling from left to right, again, there's probably something wrong with, with your suspension. A lot of people may say it's the tracking, but in my experience, it's rarely the tracking. If the tracking's out, it pulls maybe a tiny bit or you get uneven tire wear. If your car's really pulling one side or the other, there's something more serious wrong. You don't want any warning lights on the dashboard. Amber lights mean you should get that checked as soon as possible, and red lights mean you really shouldn't be driving it. Green lights, however, are okay. Also, rev the engine. Does it sound crisp? Does it sound wrong? Make sure it sounds good. And if you're not sure what an engine should sound like, well, that's a very hard one to explain, but make sure there's no out of place noticeable noises. Obviously the engine's gonna have that sound or a sound, but if there's like a sharp buzzing or a clanging or something just really out of place, then that's a warning sign. One of my best bits of advice though, is to bring someone along who knows what they're doing. That can hopefully help save you buying a lemon. Another thing not to overlook is how comfortable you are in the car. Make sure the seat moves forwards and backwards enough for you, up and down, steering wheel, everything. Make sure you're comfortable. After all, you are gonna be driving it. And just before I forget, don't buy a car without one of these. Where is it? There it is. The locking wheel nut key. Very important because if you don't have this and your car needs pretty much any kind of work doing, you're gonna be in trouble. Well, I hope this video helps you buy your first car. If you think it will, please give the video a thumbs up and check out Collingwood and Confused in the description. Collingwood are great if you're learning to drive and want to insure yourself on a friend or family member's car because you can do so without affecting their policy and risking their no claims bonus I was just talking about. You can get long-term policies and short-term policies. If you cancel a long-term policy, you will get a pro rata refund for the remaining term you haven't used. There's up to 35% off via the link at the moment and there's a £20 Amazon gift card as well. Using the link does support the channel. Also check out Confuse.com because Confuse compares many insurers and it allows you to adjust things like excess and add additional drivers or take additional drivers off to see what works best for you to get yourself the best price. Using the link in the description does support this channel. Subscribe if you want to get my future videos and until the next one, cheerio.